afternoon and welcome to all of you who are joining us for this final third Thursday conversation. I'm Janine Virtue Johnson. I serve as alumni director as well as director of campus ministries and as an admissions and development associate. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Please note that the webinar, including questions, is being recorded. If you have a technical concern at any time during the webinar, please send a chat message to the Ambient host. If you have a comment or question for our speaker, I ask that you please use the Q&A feature, which you can find by hovering over the bottom of your screen. I'll be watching for those questions and comments, and I'll select the ones that I'll ask Jana. So that all of you can, can see who else has joined this webinar, please use the chat function to give your name, location, and what years you were at AMBS. Make sure you have it set to go to all panelists and attendees, not just panelists. Turning now to the reason we are all here. Dr. Jana Hunter Bowman has been Assistant Professor of Peace Studies and Christian Social Ethics at AMBS since 2015. She also directs the Peace Studies Program and oversees the weekly Witness Colloquium, which some of you have joined in its online version this year. Jana is a graduate of Goshen College, a 2010 graduate of AMBS, and received her PhD from the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute where she was the first student to combine the disciplines of theology and peace study into a single program. Jana has several years of experience as a peace and justice worker with Witness for Peace and Use to Paz, a peace organization in Colombia. She combines the emphases of documentation, education, organization, and advocacy. Jana will start by answering several questions I have for her. After that, we'll have time for your questions and comments, and you can submit those at any time throughout the webinar by using the Q&A feature. Welcome, Jana. Thank you for being with us today. And I'll start by just asking you what you'd like to tell about yourself as an introduction to our attendees. Sure. Well, thank you for the invitation, Janine, to, um, to be here with you today and to be able to, to talk with our alumni a bit. Um, see, my name is Jana Hunter Bowman, as you well know. I um, I'm speaking to you um, from South Bend, Indiana, which is of course, or perhaps not of course, but you should also know this is part of this is land of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi. And um, let's see, I live here with I have two children, Amara and Addie, um, together with my my husband Jess. When I was talking, when I was talking to the girls last night about this, um, I asked them what they thought would be pertinent for me to mention in the introduction, and they thought it was pertinent that you knew that they are wonderful kids. So let me make sure that you all know that I have two wonderful kids, um, and um, we're enjoying lots of soccer and track these days uh, with those two wonderful kids, um, and. Um, it's also pertinent that you know that I bring to my, my time and my, my work and my teaching and my scholarship in the United States, the um, experience in the formation of Colombia, from Colombia, South America. And Janine referenced this in, in her introduction when she talked about working with Justa Paz, um, which is a, a Mennonite peace and justice organization based in the city of Bogota. Um, but Anytime that I'm introducing myself, it's important that I honor my mentors, some of my earliest mentors who so deeply shaped my theological and my political imagination. Um, so this is, um, this is my shout out to, to my community in Colombia that is such an important part of my formation as well. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very happy to hear if there's more that you'd like to know about me, but that's some of what I bring to this conversation. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a story of a time that you experienced God in a powerful way. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, as I think back on these years of, or these months, I guess I would say these months, and now it is more than a year of the pandemic and all that we've been confronted with um, during these times, 
I think a really important moment for me was the day after um, the day after I watched um, George Floyd being murdered dispassionately um, by the police. And I don't know what that was like for, for all of you, um, but even though I had lived in places where people had been unjustly killed, died unnatural deaths in brutal ways, um, this, really, this really hit me. Um, and I, I really felt at sea. Um, I did not know, I did not know what to do. Um, and I really felt like perhaps because, because of my life experience, I really should know what to do. I really felt like um, this was a time that I, I should have some answers. And I didn't, again, I felt, um, I felt at sea. I felt, I felt really lost and confused. So the, the next morning in, um, in, in contemplative prayer, which is how I begin my mornings, um, I was just asking this question. I was asking this question, what should I do? What should I do? And I was just, I remember just being, just crying, uh, really not, not sure what the, uh, having any idea what the answer to this would be. And as I sat there, um, the question changed. And um, the question became really clearly, what will we do? Um, and I almost get choked up <laughs> remembering that um, because it was the kind of, um, it was a reminder of what I have learned and who I am called to be um, that I feel like that that question changed in that time of prayer. And that new framing or that new question, I feel like was, was an answer to prayer. Um, and a significant amount of the work that I've done in ways that knit together the work that I do in my home congregation of Kern Road Mennonite Church, um, the work that I do in the in community here of South Bend and Elkhart with um, various social movements and different kinds of organizing work, um, the work that I do through classes like Witness Colloquium and some of my scholarship has um, has been a response to that to that question that I feel like was was given to me in prayer. Um, so that was that was a, an important an important moment for me as I think back on what have been just these extremely difficult times, um, and it doesn't it doesn't make them less difficult. But I I do think that for me that um, that listening is is vitally important for understanding our purpose. Um, for me, speaking for myself, for understanding my my purpose is. Um, listening, listening to what God is doing and God is saying. And that was, that's one, that's, that was one, one moment that was important in that. Thank you. That's such a powerful story. Um, thinking about the community, I'm curious, uh, what attracted you to come back to AMBS to teach here, to be part of the community a second time, uh, not, not too many years after you graduated? Yeah. Oh. And you're right, it wasn't too many years after I graduated. Um, um, in fact, I was in the middle of my PhD program, which is not a time that most people accept <laughs> jobs. <laughs> um, and so that's actually a really good question of what in the world was I doing accepting a job when I was in my third year of a PhD program. Uh, <clears throat> and some people thought that that was not very wise. So why did I do that? Um, well, I think everyone here knows AMBS mission statement, but um, I have it right here and I'm going to read it to you. Um, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary serves the church as a learning community with an Anabaptist vision, educating followers of Jesus Christ to be leaders for God's reconciling mission in the world. And I came across that um, recently when I was pulling together some, some, um, some documents to try to 
think about in, in the course of pulling together documents for a review this year of my own work. And it struck me because it, um, it reminded me of something that I had written years ago um, that I came across in the course of reviewing my field notes for a book that I've been working on. Um, and the, the, so the short of the answer to the question of why I come back to AMBS is that it's such a deep alignment with my own sense of purpose in the world, where, I've, where I'm coming from, both in terms of um, my, it is my upbringing, but this is also a really, a really clear decision and a sense of vocational call. Um, and what I came across was something that I wrote in Easter Sunday of 2006. So this is a journal entry and I'm just going to read it to you. I was in Colombia, um, try, very much trying to figure, so I, by this time in 2006, I'd um, been in Colombia since um, for about five years. And I was trying to think about what might what, what I was being called to from this. And I wrote this, okay. Um, I feel like I'm making headway in thinking about next steps for studying. I was thinking about further study. At least my questions are becoming clearer. How can I put the theological grounding I see at work with this lived Columbia experience with the United States context? Do I want to go the practitioner or the academic track? I feel frustrated that non-governmental organizations, especially church affiliate, affiliated organizations, don't seem to be as serious or strategic as other organizations. This is at least part of the reason that college, university, or seminary teaching is attractive. I talked to my dad about this. I talked to my dad about a lot of things. And I came back around to thinking, I need to acquire the skills that help me to contribute to peace building organizations and church movements so that I can help to improve what I'm right now too quick to criticize. I'm thinking about grounded academic work. Point three, how can I help to interpret what I observe and know about the contributions of these faith communities to institutions that are often called secular and those who are often rightly skeptical of quote unquote religion? I don't want to put myself on a track that carries me away from the issues and communities I care about and demands exclusively theoretical work. And yet some of what I'm learning needs to be pursued on a theoretical level. So that's what I wrote in 2006, before I um, did my master's degree at AMBS and before I went on to do a PhD in peace studies and theology. But I think that you can see from those early crystallizing moments of clarity on vocational call and what was being given to me to do out of that really privileged experience of um, working with communities on the ground in Colombia, that AMBS, um, teaching peace studies and social ethics and working as an engaged scholar at AMBS is um, a really remarkable, a really remarkable fit. Um, and at AMBS, what I can do is there is work with a community of scholars and students, a community of learning, where there's alignment between uh, my own identity as um, a practitioner, as well as a scholar and a teacher and a, a member of the Anabaptist community, where also my family is welcome. Um, it's really wonderful to be at a place where my kids aren't considered to be a nuisance. Um, so those are, those are that, that sense of alignment of, of purpose where various dimensions of myself are not in tension with one another, but are received as, um, as integrative of a part of the whole. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but for me, that's, um, that's why AMBS has been such a wonderful place to be. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love that you could find your journal entry from that long ago and see how well it fits everything together like that. Yeah. You mentioned a book. I just have to ask you before we go into your classes, tell us about the book that you're working on. Sure. You know, before I do, there's one other thing that I want to mention that I think um, is, is really important to me about my experience at AMBS. Um, because I, everything I've said 
might be something that one would suspect from an external perspective in terms of fit. Uh, but I want to name also something that has been a part of my experience at being at AMBS in that AMBS gives an incredible amount of, of intellectual freedom and really trusts its faculty to be providing leadership. Um, and so for me, as someone who's in the field of peace studies and ethics, that's been really important. And, um, and perhaps as someone who's coming in as a woman, um, that's been extremely important. Um, as someone who's coming in and people ask, what's it like to be in a position where John Howard Yoder was once, um, who would created that position in some ways, what's that been like? And I would say that the, the trust that the institution has um, in, has placed in me in order to not just allow me to, but expect me to revamp the curriculum, expects me to find the problems with the kind of peace theology that many of us inherited as we move forward. Um, that doesn't just invite me to, but expects to challenge in order to build a tradition that we all love has been a vital part of what may, has made the experience itself life-giving um, and not just a good fit from, from an external perspective. So I just wanted to add that. It occurred to me that that's um, an important part of the experience as well. Um, uh, let's see here. You asked about the book project. Yes, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is um, this is something that's been a long time coming. So what the um, and I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but that's not the point. the The point here, I think, in this book project is that in my years in Colombia. Um, I discovered that there was the, the communities that I was working with, the war affected communities on the ground, were transforming violence in the midst of war in ways that was imperceptible to those who were assumed to have the power to do the work of violence reduction and peacemaking. Let's say, um, the, the US Embassy was a group that I also worked with in the course of doing human rights and peace building work with Justa Paz. And these communities were completely, in, flew under the radar, let's say, of the human rights lens and tools that, um, that, were, that were used, that were, the, were predominant um, in such places as an embassy or through other governments. Um, and what they were doing on the ground and the kind of work that they were doing the really remarkable work they were doing was was imperceptible, and I I realized that um, in to to fast forward a little bit that the kind of problems that I identified on the ground didn't only exist on the ground in Colombia in the practical world of peace building, but these were also problems that existed in the world of peace studies and Christian social ethics that. We're, there are some um, theoretical constraints some theological constraints that kept us from really appreciating what these communities, these war affected communities were doing on the ground and how they were transforming violence while they're living in the midst of it. And not just transforming direct violence, but then really working and partnering with other war affected communities in ways that were confronting and challenging some of the conditions for the possibility of violence that had been existing for, that had, um, were part of a colonial legacy. So were clearly um, deep-seated um, root causes of the conflict. And so what this book is trying to do is through telling stories of the experience in Colombia, identify some of the possibilities and the shortcomings, and then um, put forth a constructive account of theological peace building that's again rooted in the experiences of these communities and reflecting with them on their experiences in order to make this more broadly accessible. Wonderful. And tell us about the classes you're teaching this year, um, both in the fall and the ones you just finished teaching in the spring semester. Um, 
what what has engaged you the most in those? Sure. Um, well, maybe I'll start where um, I left off, and that was in commenting on this question of what were I left off in talking about the work of knitting together personal engagement on the ground with um, community based movements with classwork and with congregational work and denominational work and beyond. Um, and that would be with in the context of what we're calling now witness colloquium. I think it was formerly mission colloquium and peace colloquium and those have now merged to what we're calling witness colloquium. And um, we, we made discoveries along the way during the pandemic. And one of the, the discoveries during the pandemic is that because everything was online anyway, we really could be carrying on a conversation much more broadly than what um, we had in the past. Now, of course, we're not the only ones to have discovered this, but this, is, um, but, but this was an important element of the shape of witness colloquium in this academic year. Um, and so then what we did um, in, for, for witness colloquium in the fall was to organize what we called um, a, a, a series at the beginning of, this, of the academic year in the fall, simply called Understanding and Engaging Movements for Justice. And here, what we were attending to is the, the, the events of 2020 had really laid bare all kinds of inequalities that have plagued the United States and the global community for obviously a very long time. Um, we were attending to the intersections of the pandemic, ongoing racialized violence, as well as the kind of hate-filled political rhetoric that was filling the air. Um, and we were noting that these were exposing the costs of the status quo and were really urging us each to examine our roles in advocating for justice. Um, of course, at AMBS, we are very much attentive to and focused on serving as living alternatives to violence um, through offering protection and seeking justice, or minimally, this is the way that I'm understanding, one of a critical expression of the nearly a 500 year tradition of Anabaptism. Um, so this, this kind of um, communal nonviolence um, was something that I was working with, but we're also noting that Anabaptists, of course, are not the only ones that were concerned about um, what was being exposed and thinking about what kind of responses we might offer. Um, so in the last fall, we partnered with the Kroc Institute for International Peace for this series, Understanding and Engaging Movements for Justice in 2020. And we invited different voices from different streams of nonviolence including communal liberationist and strategic nonviolence to speak to the power of nonviolence in action in as we were thinking about responding to the challenges of the challenges of our times. Um, so in this series, we we spoke with Sarah Nahar, um, who is also an AMBS graduate. We spoke with Maria Stefan and David Courtright who from the perspective of strategic nonviolence from USIP and the Kroc Institute for International Peace respectively. Um, we spoke with Liz Theo Harris, who is one of the coordinators and directors of the Poor People's Campaign. Um, we also spoke with uh, Patti from Movimiento Cosecha, which is an immigrant led movement for justice um, with a, a group here in South Bend. This is a group that I'm, um, working with closely in this, in this, in this time, um, and others. We, we heard also from international students um, who have lived through tumultuous um, election cycles. And we also had a really important conversation with Leroy Berry and his daughter, Melinda Berry, who's of course also on faculty at AMBS. Um, as we were thinking about understanding what was going on, and thinking about engaging in movements for justice. And I was delighted to see the kind of broad-based participation that I think really expressed a level of interest and enthusiasm and recognition for, of, of, of the pertinence of these questions 
for thinking together, for thinking together and responding together. Um, so that's that's an example of one class that was was exciting and important to me. And um, maybe I should just say that that was the fall. And then in the spring, we also continued with some of these themes because people asked for it. We had pastors, especially um, pastors and lay leaders who were involved in organizing that said that was really exciting and really interesting, but we need more. And because of their request, um, I reached out to Jonathan Smoker, who's the author of Hegemony How To, who's done a lot of work in organizing um, over the past 10 and 20 years. <clears throat> and we had a series of conversations with him, uh, particularly with people who are doing movement building and organizing um, where they're located in their, in their homes. And that was, again, that was also really exciting. Um, really exciting to be thinking together about what it means to have um, an Anabaptist, think about Anabaptism and the way that Anabaptism as a particular tradition um, contributes to these broader based movements. What does that mean? And how do we think about our work um, in engaging in movements that are against violence and that are working to build peace? Um, so that's, that's, one, that's one, one credit hour class, uh, but that's not all we're doing. Um, shall I continue to talk about others, Janine? I recognize that I, I did carry on a bit on that one. As you can see, I'm very excited about these things. Um, yes, please uh, tell us about the other classes as well. Okay, all right. Um, some of the other classes that I teach, each fall I teach an introduction to peace studies and nonviolence class. This course introduces students to the field of, or an approach of transformative peace building. This is rooted in an Anabaptist tradition, particularly thinking about the contributions of John Paul Lederach and the way that John Paul helped to shift the thinking on peace building, um, again, from predominantly a focus on elite actors in top-down theories of change to thinking about the work of grassroots and mid-level actors in not just ending crisis or putting a band-aid on crisis, but thinking about identifying and transforming the, the roots of conflict and the roots of violence. And um, a, a core tenet of a transformative approach to peace building is that conflict is normal. In fact, conflict will be really important sometimes as, there are, as we recognize the existence of injustice. So what does it mean to accept conflict as a potentially generative and transformative opportunity? And what does it mean to, to work with that from, from the communities of um, where we're of power for us as churches, as Christian communities um, in, in the world? So um, in that class that we, we begin in looking at the, the trajectory and a particularly Anabaptist inflected movement into this work of, of transformation. And then we consider um, the different ways in which we might understand different forms of violence and, and how they come about and what are the different possibilities for transforming them. Um, so this is, a, this is an introduction to peace studies and to nonviolence, which of course indicates to you that we're also tracing some of the, the trajectory of other thought leaders on, on nonviolence, including Martin Luther King, including Gandhi, in, including Deming, um, in, including some of the important thinkers out of Palestine, uh, women out of Palestine. Um, so that's, that's introduction to peace studies. Um, in the spring, this, so this semester, one of the classes um, that I taught was political theology and ethics. And here what we're thinking about um, is, well, a couple of things. Um, I'll mention two of the, the major strands, is how do we think about politics theologically? Um, and what does, what does it mean for us to think about politics theologically? Um, as, as Christians and as people who are located within a really long tradition of Christianity. Um, and and that, that then leads to questions of ethics. Another strand of the class is to notice the way in which Western Christianity emergent out of Europe 
has shaped so many of the dominant institute, political institutions of Western civilization. Um, and what are the traditions and what are the assumptions that have so deeply, again, shaped these institutions in which we find ourselves? And so what does it mean for us as Anabaptist Christians then to live in the world of politics that's deeply shaped by, by this European tradition? particularly as those of us who um, identify ourselves as followers of Christ and who then are particularly concerned with those who are marginalized and, and, um, and affected by violence multiple times over. How do, so providing tools to help us think through some of these, um, some of these opportunities and challenges today. So that's, um, that's political theology. Um, a sip of water and then I'll continue. I also teach courses on religion, violence, and peace building. Um, that course has, in, the, in recent years has focused on the peace process in Colombia. Um, the final agreement for, uh, for peace was signed in late 2016 in Colombia. And so we trace the roles that different kinds of religions and religious actors have played in that complex conflict. Um, and then look at the, what, what the opportunities that, that remain, or that and as, a, as a way, as a case study for thinking about secularisms, for thinking about religion, for thinking about theologies, multiple kinds of lived theologies, um, as a way of thinking about all of the ways that Talk of God has had multiple kinds of impacts. Um, and then another area of work is with student internships. The third semester, Peace Studies students do an internship somewhere in the world. And with that internship, students do two modules. One module is on spirituality, and the second module is on field notes. The, the starting point for both of these is an Ignatian perspective on paying attention. And the question being specifically, what are you noticing? And then we draw deeply and learn very much from the Ignatian tradition uh, of the examine as a way of structuring our, our noticing um, on, on, on a spiritual level as we develop some of the, the tools for self-reflection and for nourishment um, through the the challenging times of being human generally, but in particular in the work of peace building. And then the second module is on field notes. And there too, we're beginning with the Ignatian question of what are we noticing um, as Christians? And then drawing deeply from the, the skills, the strategies and the insights of, eth of ethnography, which is um, a, a practice of in the field of, of anthropology. And the, the point of this is to be able to notice deeply um, our experience as practitioners in, in the field, so to speak, in the world. And then with these noticings, with this, this now, this documentation of experiences in internships, students alongside the spirituality module. Students are practicing skills that are vital to be reflective practitioners. And that is, that is in itself um, a good. These are practices that work on the self, I think, in really important ways. Um, from my own experience, you, could, um, you can see how it's worked out for me. This is, this is, these are personal convictions, not just theoretical conclusions, but they are that as well. Um, and then in the final semester of the, the Peace, Studies, Peace Studies and Theology Master's program, students write a, an integration paper. And what they're doing in this integration paper is they're bringing into conversation the theologies and the theories that they were introduced to in the classroom, their first, three, their first semesters as a student, into conversation with their noticings as a practitioner in their internship and then bringing that into conversation as they work to refine and think through their own 
constructive contributions to the area that is their chosen subfield. Um, and so those modules play a really important role, not just for helping this to the student think deeply about what's going on in their internship, um, but also to, again, practice what we're training students to do, which is the, the work of a reflective practitioner. Some students go on and, um, to do important work as practitioners, and these skills also, of course, um, prepare students who continue on to do further graduate work. Thank you so much. I'm wondering um, if you can share with us a dream that you have for EMBS. Mm. Mm. Um, yes. And I think that you're you're seeing um, you're you're already seeing some of the um, um, some of the ways that I'm I'm living into it, and that is in terms of a dialogical process of thinking uh, of doing careful theoretical work that is also in conversation with lived experience and movements for peace and justice around the world simultaneously. Um, the, the, the witness colloquium modules, or excuse me, not the modules, the witness colloquium sessions provided that opportunity to be in, um, to be having conversations with people who have the time and luxury to think through and do some more writing and reflecting and theologizing and theorizing about some of this, these questions in conversation with people who are on the ground leading churches as pastors and doing the work of organizing or kingdom building, kingdom building, and, and then being able to come together to reflect together in order to go out and continue doing that work. Um, and not just for the sake of having an exciting lunch hour once a week, these are Wednesdays at noon, this is why I'm referring to a power lunch, um, but precisely because we are working to, to nourish and to build build those communities and to build those movements for justice. Um, so that is that is my dream. Um, and it is one that um, I'm excited that we have the opportunity to pursue at AMBS as you as you've seen. Great, thank you. We're going to uh, shift now to questions coming in from uh, the alumni who are participating. Um, the first one comes from Weldon Nicely and he asked, would you share something about a significant mentor for you and how that has been formative for you personally, intellectually, professionally, practically? Thank you, Weldon, for that question. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I, Janine, if I don't mention all of the levels on which this is true, then please remind me. Um, I have been fortunate to have a couple of significant mentors um, I will say one who was instrumental in moving in helping me think through and making movements from um, the, the work in Columbia to graduate school was John Paul Lederach. <clears throat> um, he was also working in Columbia at the time. And um, I was really interested in being his mentee in learning more from him, particularly as I felt like I was coming into all of these theoretical ceilings um, in, in, in what we were doing, just noticing the some of the, the ceilings that we were continually bumping up against and feeling like it was very important to be able to step back and think about what was going on in order to, in order to address that. Um, and, um, and, one, I'll just recount one thing. Uh, so I had, I had emailed him and I hadn't heard back from a time. And so I thought, well, he doesn't have time, which is completely fine. Why should he have time? Um, and then some time passed and he emailed back <clears throat> and I apologized um, for, for inconveniencing him with my emails. And he, what he said has stuck with me. And he said, never apologize for pursuing what you are called to do. And um, so that, that idea of um, pursuing what one knows one is called to do um, has stuck with me. Um, 
I hope that I've learned to be sensitive, more sensitive to others because also others are called to do other things um, than I probably was in my 20s. Um, but that idea of, of um, continue and persisting in one's vocational call was very significant. And I, I, I have John Paul to thank for that. Um, and then I did have the opportunity to study with him at the, the Kroc Institute. Um, and that time of transition from working as, a, as, a, as an activist, as a, as a service worker with Mennonite Central Committee, that was an absolutely profound and beautiful time. Um, from that to graduate school was not an easy transition at all. <laughs> um, it was not easy. <laughs> I did not do that gracefully, I don't think. Um, and having um, someone, John Paul among others, but John Paul who was able to help me think through and just create some pathways for thinking about working with experiences that have been so formative and that had propelled me to do this reflective and theoretical work into a world that was um, less concerned with that practical and theoretical work required that I create some new pathways um, of thinking. Um, and John Paul, among others, were, were instrumental in helping me do that work and were patient with me as I, as I fumbled my way into the creation of those, of those pathways. Um, Jerry McKenney is a theology professor at Notre Dame who has also demonstrated remarkable patience as I um, also work to um, find, find points of connection and ways of doing what I now call engaged, engaged scholarship. Um, Follow up if there if I didn't answer all of those levels. I think that's fine. Thank you. Another question comes from Laura Funk. Um, and she said, as people around the world are drawn to the Anabaptist vision, they bring a rich diversity to our understanding of mission and witness. How do we have a meaningful conversation about witness and mission between the traditional quiet in the land, social justice oriented perspectives, and the growing internationally flavored congregations in our conferences who are more evangelically inclined. Thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, the way that I think about this um, and is in terms of a need for multiple kinds, multiple ways of understanding ourselves as, um, as people of faith in the world and the ability to operate on different kinds of political levels and sometimes simultaneously. Um, so for example, um, so I think for me, the clearest way to respond to this is by speaking very concretely um, in terms of some of the, the work of, of reflection on that I've done with Columbia. Um, but Laura, follow up with me afterwards if this isn't um, speaking gen more generally enough. Um, that was the, 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 the communities that I've worked with in Colombia, and but also here actually, it's really important to be able to create a sense of a we. And that sense of a we is that identity as we is usually formed, I think, through worship, through prayer, through some different kinds of rituals together, that language is not so common in evangelical and Mennonite spaces, but different kinds of rituals together, that, that creation of a we. Um, and that, that creation of a we often has a politics that has the possibility for providing protection. Um, because even in my hands, you can see it, this we provides a space in here. Um, but we have certainly learned that a we cannot stay in inside of this space, right? Um, there's, I think there's a, an important, it's important to think about how that we that has, that if it exists, it has power. <laughs> what does it mean to, for this we to join alongside other communities that are also concerned about whether we want some understand it as the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven some people understand this as 
or the language of movements for justice has deeper resonance. Um, so what does it mean for this we then to come alongside others um, that are that are similar that are similarly called, even for very different reasons? Um, and so this the second politics would be this movement, this movement's a, a, a gradual in theological language, we'd call this movement towards the kingdom of God. This is requires structural change. We might call this movements for justice. But these are two different kinds of politics. Um, and there are two different kinds of ways of thinking about who the we's are. Because the we here is, the, is primarily the church community. And the we over here are all those um, alongside whom we find ourselves on the journey. Um, so for me, that's been it's been in, it's been helpful and necessary to be thinking about um, different moments and different kinds of, of politics. Thank you. Um, Richard Herschler is asking a question um, about violence to the unborn. And I think that uh, those topics are mostly dealt with by uh, Melissa Berry in her classes. But does, does that issue come up in your work, um, in your conversations with other students? And if so, how, how do you um, address that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. It, um, it is not a question that regularly comes up in classes, frankly. Um, but as people who want to think through, uh, if, if it would, what we would talk about is what does it mean to have a consistent stance that when working against violence um, and what are the ways, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the differences between a transformative approach to peace building that emerges from um, some Anabaptist voices is to think about what are the, um, what are the conditions for the possibility of violence? How do we understand what the, 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 um, the foundations or that which allows violence to occur? And what actually allows us to think about the transforming of the possibilities of violence? Um, and so in, in various, and so this, is, this is stands in contrast with um, an idea or a, a more exclusive focus on just on ending, on ending a crisis and really looks at what allows for transformation of injustices um, and what allows us to increase justice and increase peace. Um, so anytime a student brings a, a particular instance to bear, we would look at, we would look at the, a, a particular instance, a particular crisis uh, within that broader framework. And again, if, if this is if my questions aren't fully answering um, the the question posed, you're welcome to follow up with me. Thank you, Jana. Just a reminder to all of you participating: uh, we have a few minutes left. If you'd like to ask a question, please post it in the Q and A feature and pass that along to Jana. Jana, um, I have a question about um, since you've come to AMBS, the you have had students from all over the world. Um, can you speak a little bit about the diversity of perspectives and the richness that that brings to the work of peacemaking when you have students coming from every continent and um, many different life experiences that they carry with them? Sure. What immediately comes to mind is um, in a class in which we were studying, we were studying this idea of examining situations in which various forms of violence and injustice intersect um, in order to think about what it means to approach a situation and move towards a more peaceful situation in a holistic way. Um, so how do we understand the, the various threads that converge in, in a particular um, violence affected community? And, um, and so we were, we were looking, I don't even recall the particular community we were looking with, and a student raised her hand and she said, this is, I am far better than your case study. You, you really need to think about my experience. 
And I think that this is just sort of the, um, this is the, this is the, the fascinating point of, uh, of or, or something that we see that students from around the world bring. Um, in this particular instance, this was a woman whose family fled from Central America because they fled war. Um, she comes from a community of African descent. And so um, she's, she, she self identifies as black now. She lives in the United States. She's a woman and she is working in a particular denomination that doesn't look fondly on women in leadership. And her family is current, was currently, her extended family was currently living in Central America. And so she was regularly sending the money that she was making to Central America in order to allow for, for, their, um, for their survival. Um, and indeed, Indeed, this is this. Her, she said, um, "Well, I, I would propose that we that we tease out all of the threads and the intersections um, in 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 what and what I and my and my and the women in, in in my church are 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 experiencing." And their demographic was very similar to hers. Um, and we said this. She said this, and we we did this exercise. But this is not merely to notice the ways in which people are affected by various forms of violence, but also what this allows us to do is then think together about all of the ways in which there's the possibilities for working for transformation, and what does it mean to think about leadership in the midst of these spaces? Um, what does it mean to think about theological education and becoming pastors? in these places and the incredible opportunities for leadership and um, for nurturing thriving communities that come when, um, when we have this kind of subtle self-reflection alongside um, a theological education for pastoral ministry or for different kinds of ministries um, as AMBS prepares for. Thanks so much. Uh, we have another question from Ken Quiring um, from Brandon, Manitoba, and he starts with a, a thank you for this inspiring presentation. Please read more about the Intro to Peace course emphasis on mid and low level actors in situations of conflict. I have a sense that this emphasis would better equip ordinary followers of Jesus to engage in peace building in local situations or presentations of conflict. Our congregation are not interested in public protesting, but are curious about engaging in more relational ways. Ken, thank you so much for that question. Mm -hmm. Well, was that from someone named Ken? Is that what I heard you say, Janine? Okay. Ken, what I want to do right now is to share my screen and to draw. Oh, I can. Janine, do you want me to do this? I, I'm really tempted to launch. Okay, I'm going to do this really quickly because I can. Let's see if I can do this. Oh dear. Uh oh, what have I done? Oh, here we go. Um, oh, Ken, now we've done it. Now I don't know what happened to my screen. Okay, I need to stop sharing. Um, okay, I can see that it's not going to work for me to try to do anything but just look into the camera. So in short, and Ken, you and your friends should come take this class if you're interested, but in short, Imagine a pyramid, and in this, this is a, a pyramid of society. And at the top, we see are located the elite level actors. And in the middle, we have mid-level actors. And at the bottom are what we typically call grassroots. And the um, state-oriented way of thinking would assume that power is located at the pinnacle of the triangle. And here, this is where we see, we wait for, let's say the government of Colombia to sign a peace agreement. In this model, we wait for there to be a new policy that is passed that resolves a particular problem that we're experiencing. Um, but that is, um, that is seeing and thinking like a state. And that's not what we do as Anabaptists, right? Um, and so what we're, what we're particularly interested in is thinking about the work at the mid-level and the work at the grassroots. And to speak in terms of theories of change, which might be a, a simple way to do this, is that if we're relying on stakes, we're relying on a top-down theory of change, right? 
um, if we're thinking about work with the grassroots of community organizing, of building power together, we might think about bottom up theory of change. Something that is a, a particular contribution of John Paul is John Paul Lederach, um, forerunner of thinking about transformative peace building and Baptist tradition, is middle out. What is the work that those who are already organized in communities like churches who have easier access to both policymakers or to those who are located at the, we're calling the elite level here, decision makers in a city um, or other, and other decision places of, of policy decision making, as well as the work, as well as have easier and more ready access to people in the grassroots who may or may not be organized. What are the, the, what are the possibilities for working middle out um, and, and leveraging that possibility? And quite a few churches are, are located here because of their relationships with denominations, because of the relationship with other churches, because of the relationship with other civic groups. Um, so this is a way that, that, that we can, um, these are different theories of change that we think about. And this is particularly pertinent because of course, Anabaptism thinks quite a bit about the upside down kingdom, right? Where we're thinking about overturning some of the, the dominant ideas about power. Thanks. I think Ken was also trying to get at this sense of uh, what do people in the pews, what can they do besides protesting? Protesting isn't their thing. And so I think you're, you're saying we need to be imaginative about ways that we look at the grassroots um, participation in these processes. Is that correct? Sure. And I mean, organizing, organizing is a, is a very different, um, it's a very different way of thinking about addressing problems than is protesting. Organizing in terms of thinking about um, organizing power and being engaged through, through different cycles and not just in reaction to the latest horrible thing um, is a really different way of thinking about responding than protesting. So that would be one. Um, one inroad that would be aligned with this pyramid that is distinct from simply going out and, and protesting. Thank you so much, Jana, for engaging all of these questions. And we um, are very grateful to you for all of the inspiration you have given us and for giving us an insight into your work at AMBS. And thank you to our alumni for your ongoing support of AMBS, for participating in this way, for your prayers, your financial support, your influence on other people, both donors and prospective students. Um, you really are our most important influencers in the church. We have three more upcoming alumni virtual reunions for those who attended AMBS in the first two decades of this millennium and a midday reunion on June 10th for alumni of any time period. If you go to the alumni part of the AMBS website, you can sign up on the page for virtual reunions. Also, you should have received word about a new program that our church leadership center is starting. They would like your input as they develop leadership integrity circles for retired pastors, where they could, where pastors could share their experiences of retirement and hear input and feedback from others going through similar experiences. If you'd like to be part of an exploratory meeting on Tuesday, June 15th at 10 a.m. Eastern time, they would love for you to join. Please contact the program administrator, Julia Schmidt, by email at jschmidt at ambs.edu, or email me if you didn't catch that. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon, and also to IT Director Brent Graber, who has provided technical support. This concludes our third Thursday conversation for today, and we will be sending you um, all of the participants um, a survey soon to see if you'd like to keep doing this next year, and if so, in what format. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.